Okay. Hey there, everybody. It's Dave Turner, and I'm interviewing Marty Meisner of the Mayfield Four. Say hi, Marty. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, Dave. Thanks for thanks for doing this. Well, thank thank you for uh, agreeing to talk and stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the old days of making music with uh, Miles Kennedy. We're going to talk about your involvement with Citizen Swing, uh, how that. Uh, uh, kind of led to the Mayfield Four. We'll hear about your experiences with that band and we'll catch up with what's been going on with you since then. It's been a while, so yeah. So let's go Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go all the way back to like, I don't know, elementary school, middle school. You, you grew up with, with Craig Johnson and, and, and some, tell us all about that. Well, I, I became friends with Craig probably when I was around 12. So he just lived right up the street from me. Uh, Zia and Miles were a little bit younger than than me. I think two years, um, two years difference. So, uh, but with Craig, we he played guitar, and I was I knew that I just wanted to play bass for you know I wanted to be a rock star when I was 12, 13 years old. Um, so we started jamming, and back then it was you know vinyl. Um, you either had eight track tapes. Man, I'm dating dating myself here. Right were vinyl and that's how I started kind of learning how to play bass was you know just putting the vinyl on the record player and dropping the needle and doing it over and over and over and over again uh, until I would learn the bass lines. So Craig and me started kind of jamming together and um, later on in obviously junior high like like you I was involved with band and jazz band and so I played several different instruments and picked up the bass when I was 12 13 and really wanted to play um, in junior high jazz band which led to high school jazz band and uh, after high school um, again Miles and Zia were a year or two behind me Craig was a year ahead of me. So I think he graduated high school in 80, 84, possibly 85. Um, so Craig and I had a, back then it was called a top 40 band um, or a cover band. And we would just play other people's music or, you know, what, whatever was, was hot on the charts back then. And, and um, that's kind of what started that music uh, career as far as doing that for money, along with going to uh, college and being involved with the jazz studies program at Spokane Falls. Um, I did go to Western Washington University and on a scholarship and studied under Chuck Israel's um, upright acoustic yeah. bass. And, yeah, but um, that's how it kind of started with with Craig and I. Um, and then that kind of, you know, we all Miles and Zia had various bands that they were playing in in high school and junior high. And, uh, but there was that camaraderie. So we all kind of supported each other with the bands that we were, you know, performing in. Um, after, gosh, this was years later, but after Western, uh, I ended up moving back to Seattle, back to Spokane, back to Seattle. And Miles had his, uh, well, Citizen Swing. So he was doing Citizen Swing along with the top 40 band that he was playing in. Right. Uh, pay the bills. And he had asked me if I would uh, play bass. And I said, you know, I'm totally up to record anything and um, just kind of see how it goes. And uh, thus that led into um, playing on a few tracks for Citizen Swing, but it really wasn't my kind of my shtick, so to speak. Right. Um, I just, I was in a band in Seattle that uh, was an original rock band that I, I really enjoyed and I loved the big city and I really didn't want to move back to Spokane. Right, that was so, Give, correct? That was Give in Seattle. Um, and we hadn't, we actually just did a reunion show February 29th of this last year, right before COVID. Um, but we hadn't played together for 24 years and we, rehearsed for a few hours and played a set and it was awesome raised raised I think around three thousand dollars for uh children's cancer research mm -hmm. so that was really cool and then we kind of had some other uh reunion shows planned in Arizona LA uh Portland 
<laughs> and obviously we couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's back up. Just, let's back up just a tiny bit. Were you, uh, tell me about the band Bittersweet. Were were you in that band, or was that Miles's band? Whose band was Bittersweet? That was Miles, and I believe Zia, and okay. the singer was Jason. I can't remember his his last name right now, but um, those guys were really popular. I mean, they they were. Uh, I think that they started that in junior high um, and continued it in high school. Okay. So you graduated from high school, you went to Spokane Falls, and then a year or two following that, Zia and, and Miles, or I don't know if Zia went to SFCC, but Miles went to SFCC. And, um, and you kind of went, from there you went to Western. And right. Miles, Miles stayed in town. Um, and he was doing moments notice with with Steve Haldy and Mike Shergi and Clipper Anderson, and um, the singers. <laughs> I forgot their name. Yeah, yeah right. Um, yeah, and back then, well, I think um, you know Miles. He knew that he wanted to, uh, you know, with Citizen Swing, he kind of knew that he he wanted to create uh, more of his own style music, rock oriented. Yeah, uh, and that's when he had he had asked if I wanted to move back to Spokane and play in moments notice just to help pay the bills while we tried to work on something else but there's there's a little bit of fogginess going on you know yeah that far yeah. because I mean you guys you were in Citizen Swing you guys were playing shows and you know would come to Seattle and and play shows with Give and vice versa Give did shows with Citizen Swing in Spokane yeah, so I'll, I'll fill in the blanks for you because it's. I think that's your your fogginess is like right where I sort of came into the picture. So um, I showed up. I was living in LA from '89 to '90. I had I had went to high school over in Puyallup, and when I graduated in '88, I I was going to be a rock star, of course. So I moved. I just you know I just moved to LA. I figured I'll just show up and they'll see how great I was, and I'll have a gig within a week. You know? <laughs> so. And of course that didn't happen. I was there for, you know, about a year and a half and just, I barely was able to, you know, survive. I was just working just to have a roof over my head and, and food in my, in my stomach. And I, I never did have any gigs or anything down there. So I, I was like broke, destitute. Uh, I think I was 20 and my dad was living here in Spokane and I called my dad up and I just said, Hey dad, I'm, I'm like, can I move, can I move home? <laughs> Cause I've got nothing, you know, LA didn't work out for me. And he said, yeah, come on up. And so that's, I moved here to Spokane and, uh, you know, got settled. And, and then I went to Spokane Falls. And I think I just missed all of you by, you know, maybe a quarter uh, or, or a couple of quarters. And, and so I was there right after Miles left and you had been gone by that point. But I was, I got there and I started taking bass lessons with Clipper Anderson, who was playing in Moments Notice and Cosmic Dust, right? Right, right. Yeah, so so Clipper, I was taking lessons with Clipper. I was playing at Spokane Falls and the big band and all that stuff. And that was about the time that, you know, I went and saw Clipper play at the top of Ann Kenny's to see Moments Notice. And that was the first time I ever saw Miles and, and Mike and stuff. And then that was about the time that Clipper decided to move to Seattle. And so, oh, yeah. yeah, so when Clipper moved, uh, Jim Templeton offered me the bass chair to cosmic dust and so i that's when i joined that and that's when i actually met miles and you know we did our little jazz gigs at hobart's uh over on fourth avenue and stuff like that and uh so i think in the meantime that's when he was talking to you about you know citizen swing which i don't know if it had been named at that point or not i think originally it was the miles kennedy band right does that sound kind of familiar they didn't yeah, i think i think they had chosen citizen swing because I, yeah okay yeah. Yeah, but but yeah, I'm not sure because there was you know management involved and kind of one direction that she wanted to go and one direction that Miles wanted to go. But yeah, uh, well, there's there's that video interview uh, that's on my on my channel that was that aired on I think it was like KXLY Channel Four. It aired in 1996, and I I recorded it when it came out. But but he Miles talks about you know they wanted to call it Carolyn wanted to call it the Miles Kennedy band he's like no 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 and so somehow Citizen Swing you know I don't know if Craig came up with that or I don't yeah know. I don't know I, so, I yeah so so Clipper moved away I got the gig with Cosmic Dust that's how I met Miles 
And in the me at the same time, you were, you know, laying down tracks for some of that. So you did the baseline for you see it, right? Yeah, that's you. Yeah. And so how did tell me about how that is that is that the only track you played on? Or I think there were a couple other ones, but you know, I don't remember. I haven't pulled that CD out for so long. Yeah, there's a couple there's a couple tunes that have like a key bass part and you know that like Steve Haldy laid down I think and maybe yeah, think maybe so. you doubled that at some point and then it got removed I don't I don't know either cuz from from listening to it I mean you're on that track I don't know that they gave you credit for that though I'm not sure but everything else is either me or like Steve Haldy played a keyboard bass part so I don't know if maybe you laid some tracks and they didn't use them but what was what was it like to go lay that track down for you see it? I mean, it's, it's a really funky song. Was that something that you were like, was funk kind of in your wheelhouse or was that kind of outside of your comfort level or tell me about that? I think back back then, it, you know, being involved with the Jazz Studies composition uh, program at Falls, you know, I was probably like you, I was playing my bass for like eight hours a day. So I was in all different kinds of groups. I was in a fusion group, big band, a trio, uh, you know, lots of different, different, um, different style groups. And I loved funk and I really was into kind of the slap bass thing okay. back then. <clears throat> I kind of, it's kind of weird because I'm left-handed, but I do everything right-handed. So when it came to funk, it's like my right hand didn't want to be as fast as I wanted it to be, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if that hindered me, but uh, playing bass on that song, you know, one thing that I've always tried to do is really go off of a singer's melody uh -huh. um, and kind of accent that along with being able to lay down, you know, kind of a, the bottom end with the with the kick drum being married to the kick drum and snare. So um, I just kind of came up with that bass line and modeled it around Miles Miles's vocals. Right. And, uh, you know, just try to kind of be a little funky. But yeah, during that time, my bass, where I would wear my bass, obviously got lower and lower and lower. Right. And that, <laughs> so that gets tougher and tougher of, and tougher. To yeah. Do. So I, I kind of fell out of of going that funk route and the fusion route where you really thrived. I mean, you're an amazing bass player, um, you know, and and being knowledgeable with reading music and composition obviously led you to to the career you're in yeah. i always told myself by the time if if i turned 30 and i wasn't in a signed band i would i would pursue my teaching degree yeah, yeah. so and that just obviously didn't happen <laughs> life happened right instead yeah, yeah yeah well it's and and i i'm pretty sure that you tuned your bass down to e flat for that track right because it's it's an e flat yeah. It's in concert E flat, but that bass line is terrible to play in E flat. I am almost sure you must have tuned down for that. I'm pretty sure I did. I know we had talked a few years ago about, you know, the transcription for that song. And yeah, to be honest with you, it just kind of fell to the to the to the side of, you know, yeah. priorities and everything else. But I'm pretty sure I did. I mean, I know later on I I did a lot of odd tunings. Okay. Um the sizes of strings, I would play a five string set, but I would lose the high. Gotcha. high yeah. So I would have a 130 E, e string. So oh, wow. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And use a hip shot. Yeah. I had a I had a bass tune B E A D for a while because I didn't have a five string. <laughs> I had a second four string. So I had a bead bass for the low stuff and a regular bass for everything else. But yeah, I, I remember when I was learning your bass line for that song. And, you know, we were in standard tuning and I'm playing it on a six string bass in E flat. And it was just a nightmare. <laughs> it was a nightmare. So I sort of ad adapted your line. I, I kind of got the gist of it and, and the highlights of it. But I, I don't think I ever played it, you know, exactly as you did. I think it was just it was just too unwieldy in E flat on a six string bass for me to ever do all that stuff exactly, exactly the right way. So, I, I you know, I kind of. I, had, I, I say I adapted it to work. Yeah, that's good. I mean, even later on in, in my music career, I would tune to like G, C, G, C. Okay. Yeah. Kind of, and the use a hip shot. So a lot of times I've seen people try to pull off the bass lines on for Mayfield stuff. And I'm like, wow, they're really, you know, 
working it instead right? of yeah instead of using the alternate tunings that I did. Yeah. Uh, but I've had people message me like, "How are you doing this?" And I'm like, "Ah, this is." <laughs> <laughs> no, no telling with that and well that that leads in um to my next question one of my favorite bass lines of yours is on mars hotel i just love that bass line can you tell a little bit can you tell us what tuning you're in for that and maybe tell us a little bit how you came up with that line it's just a it's a great line thanks uh i you know it kind of evolved in the studio because the original bass line that i had was it wasn't as busy. Okay. And I think when when we went in the studio with Peter Collins, um, he he really kind of just brought up, let's let's just play the hell out of this. So let's come up with something that's a lot more busy. Um, so that's just kind of what I did, and I just worked it around that. I believe my tuning, I think I'm a, a low, it could be a low B. Okay. Um, but I did a lot of stuff with just tuning down a whole step on, on my E string. So it could have been, could have just been tuned down a whole step to D. Okay. Um, but again, I haven't, I haven't played those songs for so long. Right. You know, I have a, I have a notebook with all of my notes in it um, as far as tuning and, and different things like that. But I haven't gone through those for so many years. Yeah. So it, when you were doing all that stuff live, did you have three or four bases at the ready with all the different tunings or did you just do it on one and just relearn it in standard tuning or something? I had three. Well, I always had at least two bases. So one would be in standard with my hip shot and then the other one would be uh, in, in a, a different tuning with the hip shot also. OK, so, yeah, I, I was pretty much ready to go with depending on what song that was. Right. OK. Okay, well, so let's let's kind of keep going in time. So, uh, uh, you laid the track for the first Citizen Swings uh, album. You didn't want to move back to Spokane. Your your band Give was was doing great over there, and um, so uh, I was in Cosmic Dust, and I had heard. I don't know, I, you know, it's the early '90s, so I don't remember how I heard, but I had heard that Miles was looking for a bass player, and I was like, wait a minute. He, I mean, why isn't he calling me? So I called Miles up and said, hey, I heard you're looking for a bass player for like an original music project. You know, would you consider giving me an audition? He was like, well, yeah, I would. I thought you were kind of a more of a jazz guy. And I was like, well, I mean, I like jazz, but I, I like, you know, I like rock bass and stuff too. So, so that's, I did the audition and I joined the band and tracked the rest of the record. And, and that's how that went along. And so we did some gigs and we did some gigs with you and back and forth to Seattle and all that business. Uh, but you know how how things go on. We made that first record. We had the the management group, and we weren't happy with where they were wanting to take us. And we kind of got out of that contract. I think we had to buy ourselves out of the contract. Uh, and then we started self financing our second CD, and and that just took forever. It took I think it took almost two years from start to finish to get that CD made, and it just seemed like we lost so much momentum and you know that was the same time that it was nirvana and soundgarden and pearl jam and we were just not fitting in with the sound the seattle sound and i keep thinking to myself you know just what 95 or 96 the dave matthews band came out with all that stuff and i think if, if citizen swing had just been a couple of years later who knows what would have happened but yeah well yeah. i mean there there was a lot of bands. Uh, I think it was was it three eleven. Is you know there were ska type bands that yeah. were really, really popular, and you know with Citizen Swing having a horn and keyboards and and things like that. It it you guys were rock, but still also kind of that fusiony sort of yeah. sort of sound. So it was more complex. Yeah, um, but that's what it all comes down to is kind of timing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so as the months and years went on, it's like we were trying to get gigs down in Portland and Seattle and no one would book us anymore because they wanted to hear our CD first and our second CD was just stalled out in post-production or something. And um, I think it was the summer of 95, we were driving, and this is, this is a story leading into where I'm gonna have some questions for you, but summer of 95, we're driving back to Spokane from a gig 
and Miles has a cassette tape and he says, hey, everybody, do you want to hear? Uh, I've been jamming with Marty and Zia. You want to check it out? And he he pops in this tape and it it sounded like Led Zeppelin stuff to me. I mean, I, my memory is really fuzzy, but um, I thought to myself, Miles is writing songs with other guys now. <laughs> we can't get a gig anywhere. This doesn't seem like things are going the right direction. And I don't know if anybody else in the band kind of had that light bulb go off, but I kind of knew that the days were numbered for Citizen Swing when he popped that cassette tape into the into the stereo. So do you remember making that tape? Can you tell us what was on that tape, the story behind it? How'd you get together and write? What songs were those? Well, I, if memory serves me correctly, I think at that point, you know, Miles had talked to Z and myself and he really wanted to go that rock route. And I, I think, you know, personality wise, I, I don't know. It's, you know, I kind of was always party Marty. So it's like, um, but I did have the music background and I think, um, you know, my style of playing at that point was uh, in time was just conducive to what Miles was kind of looking for. Yeah, uh, I had never played with Zia prior to getting together with uh, Miles and him. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what songs they were. I know later on there were some songs that um, were created at like four in the morning, you know, sitting with Miles and, and going through some stuff. And but it, it, there was just a, a feeling and a sound that we just knew that there was something there. Yeah. Um, you know, with how we, how we played with each other. And so I think that's what came out of that was, was that, but ironically, and we, we can circle back to this too, but almost the same thing happened the same way when my, when Mayfield was becoming no longer. Is that right? Uh, yeah. With, with, uh, with Mark Tremonti and, and the Creed guys, right. but, um, <laughs> yeah so you, you've been a mix know that, you know that no, feeling well then right you know oh, yeah feeling. yeah <laughs> it's like yeah. wait a second here <laughs> you're writing songs with other people now okay <laughs> yeah and i but i do remember at that point it was you know it was gonna craig miles um but i was unaware of that story like that's that's the first time you guys say hey guys listen to what else i'm doing you know with yeah it was it was just weird and i i really don't think i mean i of course, Craig must have known, or or maybe uh, maybe he had a feeling, but I don't think Jeff or Mike had any idea that that was basically a foreshadowing of the end of Citizen Swing. I mean, because I mean, my what I heard is that Miles was as much as everyone loved Jeff Miller and as fantastic as, as a player and stuff he was. I my what I have heard is that is that by the end there he was just really unhappy with having a trumpet in the band and he felt like it really held things back from where he wanted to go and he was so i mean we loved jeff miller and he was like heartbroken to have to say that we just can't go on anymore i think it was easier just to have a new band than to fire jeff or something like that you know what i'm saying like he didn't want to like fire me or fire jeff he just said well i'm just gonna make a new band right. <laughs> and it's been it's been great and take care you know Does that kind of sound <laughs> like what you would would think um well i mean that old phrase shit happens but you know i it, it sucks when people's personalities are involved and the friendships are involved in that way yeah. um you know i don't i don't regret being uh in mayfield and doing what we what we did yeah uh, i think how things laid out the, the path to get there yeah. you know like hearing this story was a little you know, it hurts a little bit, but, um, you know, again, that's kind of the same thing that happened after Mayfield, you know, we yeah. were trying yeah. to get off of the label. Um, and ironically, the same thing kind of happened. We were on Epic and at the time Sony had Epic and Columbia mm -hmm. and they were sister labels and they weren't supposed to compete for the same artist. Right. But, you know, after, after Mayfield was kind of ending, Columbia did offer uh, us to go over to C the Columbia side instead of the Epic side. Um, but they wanted to change the name 
of the band to the Miles Kennedy band. Oh. <laughs> and, that was a and Miles, full circle, right? Right, right. And Miles didn't want to do that. And, you know, either did Zia and I, because at that time, uh, at that point, we had let Craig go. Um, we had different management. Yeah. And it was Miles, Zia, and myself. And um, so that kind of panned out and it took a long time uh, to be able to get off of the label to mm -hmm. figure out what we wanted to do. And it, during that interim, Miles had been talking with Mark Tremonti from Creed, who yeah. was starting a new band without Scott Stapp. Yeah. So Zia and me kind of didn't know that either until yeah. after he had been talking to them. And I think during that time, it was easy for Miles to just kind of go that route, you know, kind of like the same thing that happened with Citizen Swing. It sounds very familiar. Yeah. So, um, so, so going back a little bit here. So Miles plays that tape for us. We hear that I had, I had just gotten married, you know, uh, to my wife, Jenny, probably five months prior to that. And, um, and she was like, by this, by this time, she was like, you know, Dave, are you ever going to make any money in this band? Because you, you, you leave for the weekends and do these gigs and you come home broke. And I was like, yeah, you're right. This is really not working out the way I wanted it to. And then I heard the tape and I kind of like saw the writing on the wall. And that's basically when I, I told the band that I was going to be leaving the band just because it just seemed untenable to continue. We weren't getting anywhere. We weren't getting any gigs. Our CD was just taking forever to finish. And Miles is writing music with, with you and, and Zia. And so I said, look guys, it's been a great run and, and I've, I love you all and it's been fun, but it's, it's time to move on. And I, I, my last gig was in like November of 95 with them. And I think it might've been maybe another six months tops at the most before Citizen Swing was officially broke up. And then it was like, Mayfield four, like the next week, <laughs> bam, you guys are in the clubs. So tell us about that story. Tell us, get, fill in that gap there from, from, you know, the end of Citizen Swing, the, the cassette tape, the demo writing, the songwriting at 4am. How did that get into Mayfield four, just taking over, picking up where Citizen Swing left off and just taking over and continuing on that tremendous amount of energy that Miles has? Well, again, I think we, we just knew that there was something special, you know, with all four of us and um, just by jamming and kind of creating, creating music and then Miles, you know, actually starting to, to be able to write, write songs around that. So a lot of the songs just evolved from us jamming um, and then Miles would take it and, and refine everything. So <clears throat> we ended up um, at the time uh, I'm trying to think, Eric Hoppy was uh, interested in managing us and he was kind of Susan Silver who managed and was married to Chris Cornell, uh, managed Soundgarden, Screaming Trees, a few other bands um, during that time. So Eric was uh, kind of co-managing certain bands with her and by Eric wanting to manage us, we had kind of the, the the wings and support of Susan Silver okay. management. So that really kind of helped us to be able to uh, get, get a few shows and record. We recorded, I think it was six or six or nine songs. And then, you know, just creating a demo tape to be able to get some gigs, but things really took off super fast. Yeah. Um, for, for Mayfield and and I think you know we ended up having about eight different labels that were interested mm -hmm. um, and then you know we went to New York several times to meet with different labels and we we pulled the trigger with Epic just because we loved we loved the fact that the president of Epic came to one of our shows in Seattle and normally a president of a label never goes right. to see it in a club yeah plus Pearl Jam was on Epic and so we we really wanted to kind of be able to follow that path yeah and knowing that the label really wanted to work with us on a, on a grassroots label or a grassroots you know kind of um, level yeah level and plan so that's why we we ended up going with Epic now little did we know our A&R team 
signed Macy Gray at the same time. And at that point, uh, plus Richard had left Epic and they had a new man, a new president. So we were kind of scared. We were in the studio working on the first record um, and we didn't really know what was gonna happen, but we were able to, we stayed on the label, but tons of money was being thrown at Macy Gray to, right. to promote her. Um, and so we just started, we bought a van and bought a trailer <laughs> Sounds and familiar. Started touring the country. <laughs> I think yes. we did. Sounds familiar. Yeah, I mean, I think we we did we did like eight eight tours across the U.S. and two or three of every province of Canada, but um, just trying to really just build up our following. Yeah, yeah. So, so how did the name Mayfield Four come about? Obviously, four members, but where did the Mayfield part come from? The fans want to know. So at the time. MTV had Matt Pinfield uh, as a, a VJ or whatever you, you would call them back then, but he right. was super popular with, with the shows that he had on MTV. And there was a band called Juliana Hatfield, okay. uh, and it was Juliana Hatfield 5. And so we just kind of tossed around, you know, how do, how do we say there's four people and, you know, we, we also love Curtis Mayfield, but um, it, I don't know, it just kind of, just kind of happened. But yeah. it was based upon Matt Pinfield, Juliana Hatfield, and Curtis Mayfield. And at the time, there was a band, um, one of the guys in Tears for Fears, I think he had a band called Mayfield. Okay. And so we threw the four on, the, on it. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. There's the official definition or yeah, uh, the story not a county in Spokane that we all lived in. It was nothing like that. It just kind of, yeah. Just kind of Good. Okay. Well, so, uh, so we'll take a, a little pivot here. So when I left um, Citizen Swing, you know, I, I went into a, a real state of depression because I felt like, you know, I lost my band brothers and no more gigs. And I was, you know, I was really bummed out that it didn't really work out for us. And uh, I, I really, I don't know. I, I really missed making music with everybody. So I, I don't know. Maybe you can relate to this too as, as part of what happened with, with Mayfield or whatever. But um, uh, yeah, I was like really probably two years just super depressed about how it, how it didn't work out. Did you feel something like that after the Mayfield 4 sort of dissolved and, and everybody went their own ways? Definitely. I mean, I think... Uh you know, the way Mayfield disbanded was, was a little odd, but, you know, there was a lot of turmoil that was going on during that downtime of trying to get off the label. Uh, are we going to keep creating music together, Zia Miles and myself? Um, or, you know, is this it? So, uh, but I know that I, I did the same thing. I went through a massive time of depression um and i did a lot of self-medicating and it you know there's a lot of things that have happened in my life that kind of it's like oh shit can something else bad happen uh, what else can happen you know it's yeah. like my i feel like my life you know as a bass player in a band that was somewhat recognized you know we weren't platinum or anything like that but that was part of my identity yeah and uh so even during that time, you know, it's like I, I performed with uh, Jim Boyd from Spokane, uh, amazing artist that he unfortunately passed away also. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> Annie O'Neill, who's from Spokane, she's yeah. in Seattle. I did some shows with her. I worked with uh, a producer for Disney and Nickelodeon art or actors that were artists. So I was able to play some music but but that identity for mayfield and what i you know truly loved yeah was gone and so uh along with a lot of other things happened you know i broke my back in three places uh my father was dying of pancreatic cancer um there's so many things but you know again i was self-medicating so i at this point right now in my life i mean i'm a recovered alcoholic 
uh, I know that if I look back then, I used um, alcohol and some drugs as just to self-medicate. And that kind of became part of my destiny up until about seven years ago. Yeah. But, you know, it, it really messed with my with my life and my reasoning and everything else. So um, I haven't actually even communicated with Miles for years. I've written him a couple letters. I've talked to our old attorney, um, you know, just trying to resolve some things or yeah. make amends. Yeah. Because even to this day, I don't know why things have transpired the way they have. Yeah. Um, there's speculation, but again, you know, it's like I'm a different person now than I was because I had that image in Mayfield. You know, I was good at what I did. I, I think I'm a pretty good bass player, yeah. um, you know, but my attitude had changed and I became very bitter and I became very depressed. And yeah, that that's kind so of interesting because I, I mean, I, you know, I think, I think in you and I in, in many, many ways are, are really similar and in, in ways that we didn't even know. Because I, you know, like you said, you get tied to that band. That band is your identity, you know. And and when it just evaporates, you really feel lost. You just like, what happened? And everything that I'm put, I poured, I poured every essence of myself into this, and like that, it's gone. Now what? And you've experienced that as well. Yeah, and I mean, there were, you know, this was, I don't even remember how many, it probably was about seven years ago. I even, you know, I had some demos that uh, Zia and Miles and me had worked on, and um, I had a SoundCloud account, mm -hmm. and I posted things there privately, um, just because it was like, you know, we still had followers, we still had people that were interested in what we were doing. Yeah. And, and it was such a big part of my life that I wanted to be able to share some of those things. Now, I didn't know I wasn't looking at, you know, copyright or songwriting credits or anything like that. I was just, you know, general, generally just genuinely yeah. trying to kind of give give back something that had been a part of our lives. Yeah. Uh, those end up getting taken down, but I don't know if that even had anything to do with why I don't communicate with Miles. But um, you know, there were there were times where there, there was some great music that never got released. Um, so, same with Citizen Swing. There's there's a couple tunes that we wrote that didn't make it onto a record, or, and uh, there's no existing recordings of them. And I'm like trying to remember. Oh, they was like. You know, I never I remember the chorus, but I don't remember the verse at all. But yeah, and I, you know, I I did something similar to that about the time out uh, 1996. Remember when mp3.com, the website actually came out? That was like right before Napster. Yeah, and yeah. I did I did a similar thing. I mean, I had recordings and I I uploaded them to mp3.com just as like uh here they are, you know, for whoever wants to hear them again, because that that second CD was almost impossible to get a hold of. And do you remember you called me? And I, I think Miles must have asked you to. You called and, uh, and and I guess we talked on the phone and you you told me that Miles was like he didn't want that those that those songs getting out there anymore because of he was trying to, you know, push May before. Do you do you remember that conversation we had? And I, I barely remember it, but again, I was probably drinking quite heavily back then. <laughs> you know, like, hey, you better quit putting that music up, you know, but whatever. Um, but I, I think I, I do remember slightly that I think, um, it, you know, it must have been communicated in some way. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't even know how it, it was so rudimentary technology, then I don't even know how people would have a found the music on mp3.com and b how miles even heard about it. I mean, it's just like, right. it didn't happen. But but it's yeah, so interesting to me that same with SoundCloud. It's like yeah. I I didn't know, you know, technology wise. It's like if I put something up on private, it's like um, I didn't know that it could be downloaded or pulled from that. You know. Yeah. So, it's it's um, it's interesting that you and I not only did we have the same sort of um, experience with the dissolution of the band, but our our reaction to that was the same thing. We want to we want to share this music and and sort of preserve it as long as we can in, in almost identical ways. I, that's just fascinating. I never would have guessed. 
Yeah. And, you know, I even think, you know, looking back, it's like when we let Craig go after the first record, it was because we thought we were supposed to go a different direction. And there were some other things, you know, with personality wise, you know, traits that that Craig had. I love him to death. I hated him for a while. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate of his death. Yeah. Same with Jeff Miller. Yeah. But, um, you know, we thought we were supposed to go this direction. In fact, that's why we even let our old manager, Eric, go because we thought we were supposed to be molded into what was conceivable by the masses. And I think if we look back at what actually happened, um, we really kind of lost our way. In a, yeah. in a sense. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about Craig. Uh, so um, I went a long time before I got a chance to, to talk to Craig again, just because, you know, I moved and we lost touch and stuff like that. But I, I eventually did get back in touch with, with Craig, oh, I don't know, 2002 or 2003, maybe. And uh, over the years, we've, you know, we, we visited and stuff. And um, I asked him his side of the story, because the, you know, I, I remember I went to pig out in the park, it must have been 98 or so, I don't, I don't know exactly, but it was, you guys were playing pick out in the park and I went down to see the band and Craig was not there. And so at, afterwards, you know, Miles was at the meet and greet or whatever. And I asked, I asked Miles, you know, where's Craig? And the answer was, well, it just didn't work out, which I thought was, you know, a very polite way to not tell the truth. So, you know, I asked Craig what happened and, and Craig's story, Craig's side of this whole thing was that, you know, personalities, the, the business had changed people and it was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, the, it was more about the business than, than making music. And it just, you know, there was fisticuffs and fighting and, and stuff like that. And it just, you know, I don't know. What's, what's your side of it? Let's hear your side of it. As well, much I as think, you want to talk about. Yeah. You kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, there were personality things. There were, there were certain things that Craig did that weren't, con weren't conducive to the band at the time. Um, he was hard to, it seemed like he was angry at everybody. Um, you know, he, he threatened to punch me several times. It was just, there were some crazy things that were going on, but uh, I think it came down to, we, you know, we, we almost feel like he wasn't pulling his weight, yeah. so to speak, but uh, you know, with loading and unloading and, those kind of things. And I, I think the business did change us in a sense. Um, maybe there was a little bit of self entitlement involved. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it just, just wasn't working out, you know, and again, right after that is I, it was either right after or right before that's when we let Eric, our manager go um, just because of the direction. And, and at that time we, we hired on, Everclear's management team. Okay. So, but back to Craig, I think, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. It, it took me a long time. Um, and again, I was in, that was when I was heavily drinking and stuff because um, it took me a long time to try to reconnect with Craig, just, yeah. just like with Eric. I mean, I even tried to reach out I was going to drive to Spokane just to see Craig, just to hang out with him. Mm -hmm. And this was probably two weeks to a month before he, before he was killed. Yeah. And I was, when, when I heard that news, it was like, Oh my God, I can't believe that, you know, cause I just wanted to reach out because, you know, I'm in my fifties now. It's like, there are certain things of life lessons that I've learned and there are certain things that happened that could have been different, but they aren't, and I can't change the past, but yeah. I can try to, I can try to resolve issues. Yeah. And that's what I had wanted to be, you know, reaching out to Craig for is just to kind of come back and say, Hey man, I love you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's unfortunate though. Yeah. But, yeah. I had just sent him, uh, I usually would, usually we'd get together like once, uh, once a year over the summer just to have a beer. And I had texted him that, uh, that summer and said, Hey, you can be around, you know, we need to, we need to get a beer and stuff. And he was like, you know, I'm really busy right now in my cabin or something like that. And we never, we never got a chance to grab a beer that year. And then that, that, that September, just tragic tragedy. So yeah. I, I miss that. 
Yeah, definitely. And then even with Jeff, you know, it was like that yeah. was so sudden. Yeah. And, you know, I knew Jeff back in, in the day, you know, yeah. from college and, and you guys performing with Citizen Swing. And, and um, you know, it's like that's why I did go to Craig's, you know, yeah. way or celebration of life. And I did go to Jeff's. Yeah. Um, it was unfortunate that nobody else. Yeah. Went. <laughs> you know, like I would have expected, you know, yeah, kind of supporting the people that helped make or create who you are as an individual or even from your past experience. Yeah, that was, and that was, me, it's, yeah, it was, I was it, awkward. It was an awkward, awkward, uh, awkward non-presence, <laughs> you know, awkward, awkwardly not there. But did Zia go to, I know, Z, was Zia at Craig's celebration? Or was mm. it just, no? No. No. That's, that's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's like, again, going back to when Mayfield broke up, it's like, I think a couple of years had gone by and I reached out to Eric. And then a year or so after that, then Miles and I think Zia did, but that's how Zia, or that's how Miles and I communicated was through our old manager. But okay. just after all that time to go by and not, yeah. not kind of remember the people that were involved in your life at those points. And as time goes by, we want to heal and we want to be able to, you know, show our, our respect and, and whatnot. Yeah. That's, you know, and, and yeah. knowing Craig since I was 12, it's, it just made sense for me to want to, be a part of that his celebration of life and yeah and be there and supportive yeah so that's that's um I, I again here's another sort of parallel thing is that you know i reached out to miles at um a, around the time around that time that that craig left the band and I, I wrote him a letter just like you did and you know hey how you doing and what's new what's new what's going on and you know blah 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 i've got a you know my family's doing good i've got a baby boy all that kind of stuff and i never heard back from him no reply no anything so i i think I, you know one once again you and i are almost in the same sort of boat as like it's like we i think i think we feel the same types of feelings as part of music making as part of being in a band it's just a real deep emotional core of who we are. And when that music goes away or when those people are no longer in our lives, I think you and I just feel it so deeply that it's hard for us to almost function without those connections. I, th I think, I think a lot of people who are not musicians, you know, or artists um, may have a hard time relating to that. Just how, how much of, of our selves go into our music that we make with with other people. I think that's a that's a that's a really great connection that you you and I have. I did I didn't even know. I mean, what a great discovery to make. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's you know, it's like again being in my position up until 7 years ago, it was like, you know, 7 7 years ago I had a choice to make and it's it's like I can go back and try to make amends with people that I've wronged and and um, it's not like I even need an answer because some people don't want that, which I can I can totally respect that. But, um, you know, I, I just feel like I wanted to know, hey, did you receive my letter? Because it was very long. It was very heartfelt. Yeah. I wish you the best in your life and everything that you do. and. You know, I, I did go to see Miles perform in Alter Bridge in Seattle, um, which was February 27th or something like that. And I don't think he knew that I was there. Right. Uh, I just went to be supportive of the friends that I was with. Plus, I was doing my reunion show two days later. So, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, it's tough because we have a lot of mutual friends that are friends with him. Yeah. Uh, I thought I was still friends with Zia, but I, apparently I can't, he won't accept my following him on Instagram. <laughs> it blows me away. But um, oh, man. yeah, he's, he's a very private person and I can totally respect that. But, um, you know, there's, that's a big part of my life and yeah. I, I'm not going to lose that. Um, 
but it would be great to be able to all connect again sometime. Yeah. You know, before we're all in walkers. And, uh, <laughs> right. With instruments. Hey, check out this bass line. Back when I could play the bass, <laughs> yeah, it was something crazy. like this. <laughs> Yeah, that's, and that, that kind of gets us is to my, I, this might be my last question. I, I can't, I can't tell, but it's, it's close to my last, but people want to know, you know, is there a chance of a Mayfield four reunion? And, and I already know the answer, but, um, but go ahead and tell us, you know, what do you think, Marty? <laughs> How likely is it? Well, there have been, uh, this was, a few years ago, our old manager reached out um, to all three of us, to Zia Miles and myself, and uh, had made an offer to be able to try to do some reunion shows. There, apparently, there's certain parts of the world that Mayfield is very popular, and I'm sure that you know as well. Citizen Swing is popular, or anything that Miles, anything that Miles did is yeah, is is sought after or yeah. Or, whatnot but um there there are several countries that we could be able to do some shows in right i don't know now but this was several years ago so we tried to communicate about possibly doing some shows mm -hmm. and that just didn't pan out so i think um you know again i never communicated with miles directly it was through my old manager right and eric still communicates with zia and miles once in a while But uh, at this point right now, I, I, I would totally be up for it if everybody else wanted to do something like that. But um, I wouldn't hold my breath. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, there's been a lot of amazing bands that didn't tour or get together for a very long time after breaking up. And yeah, that has happened. But yeah, if not, I'm OK with my life. I've got a video production company and and uh, I give back to my community. I do what I can to help others. Yeah. And that's just my mission. You know, yeah. I'm doing what I do now. Yeah, that's I've seen a couple of of interviews with Miles where they will ask him, you know, um, tell us about, you know, your your older bands. Uh, what are they all up to? Would you do a reunion with them? And he's always like, well, you know, I don't know if I have time for that, or I don't, I don't even know if any of those guys are like still around, you know, he's very politely declining. Um, but you know, what can you do? Well, you can't yeah, blame even, him. <laughs> right. Well, even with Miles's solo projects, it's like, yeah. I, I would have, I would have thought that, you know, either you or I might be able to play on something like that, but apparently that's just not in the cards. Yeah. I mean, when he's not, doing Alter Bridge or Slash or Led Zeppelin or his own stuff. I mean, yeah, you're right. There's no, there's no time for that. But he did, you know, he did have Zia come back and do a track or two and, and not you. And I, that's got to sting a little bit, right? Well, again, it, it, you know, there were a lot of things that I did that I, I probably don't even remember. And that's, again, why I, why I wanted to reach out to Miles, just yeah. to kind of all things and be like, man, you know, I love you. I screwed up maybe a few times. Remind me of something I did. But again, I was in a fog for a very long period of time in my life. And, yeah. and, um, you know, I've, I've done what I, what I can. Yeah. So I wish, you know, I have no ill feelings towards anybody. I love, I still love those guys to death. And, yeah. you know, I still follow miles and see what he's doing and what he's up to. And yeah. Yeah, I do, I do too. I mean, you know, I, I look back, it's been 25 years for me. And I just, my memories of those times is just, we were just young kids and we were having the time of our lives and just going out and playing shows and trying to take over the world. You know, you just have that feeling that you're young and you can do it. You just got to work hard. And we had a lot of fun and we made a lot of good music together. And those are, those are great memories to cherish. And I think you probably have, you know, very similar memories as well oh, yeah def definitely you know it's a that was a big part of my life and it's something that i'm still very proud of yeah uh, yeah so and i'll take that to my grave yeah yeah so um any any other stories to to share from the back in the day the the on the road anything that like you know sticks out as a memory that you'll never forget that was just so great or fun or amazing 
Well, I think there's, there are out of everybody in the music industry that I have met, whether it's labels, management, other bands, you know, there is a handful, maybe five that I will still even communicate with. Um, and it might just be once in a while, but um, maybe once a year, happy birthday or reach out saying, hey, how are you? Um, but it's, it's a totally different scene now. You know, I mean, the music industry has changed so much to when, when we got signed in the nineties and, you know, things that are offered and the, yeah. you know, it's so different now, um, especially with technology that it, it almost there's, there's certain parts of the technology that artists just don't make any money. It's almost like the Columbia record house or whatever it was yeah. called. And, you know, it's like get 10 cassettes for a penny. Yeah. And I mean, that's that's a continuation now of, you know, all the streaming music services and how much artists actually get for their music. And it's, it's kind of sad, but you have to pivot the way you think. Yeah. And you're going to, to sell yourself. But I don't really have any other stories, man. It's, you know, there's, there's a lot of personal stuff. I know I still have a lot of photographs and things like that from from the day but there's there's a period of time where i just tried to clean house yeah. you know too because i had to give up that um part of my life in a sense you know i had to store it away yeah 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 i i realized um you know that that i'm i'm not cut out for for doing what you did and and what miles does i just don't have the i, I don't know if it's the personality i just don't have the right vibe i guess i i i like you know i'm happiest in a in a theater pit <laughs> playing playing for a musical you know i don't like to be in the spotlight i don't like to be recognized i don't like i mean you know i thought when i was younger i i really thought i would i i wanted to be you know famous and a rock star and all the stuff that like like we talked about and then you know just just the smallest little taste of that that i got in citizen swing was like this, I don't like this. As I don't like to be the focus of attention and have everyone. I mean, I got, someone was making comments on a Citizen Swing video on, on my channel about how high I wore my bass. You know, look at that guy, how high his bass is. What a doofus, you know, I was like, geez, I can't play what I play with my bass down right. low. So that's just the way it is. And if that's all the people can do is nitpick about stuff like that, I just, I'm out. I just can't. Yeah. That's bullshit. It's like, I mean, because. Because when I was doing that, it's like, you know, kudos for you because you're a music teacher, you play in theater, you use everything that you've learned and you're doing what you want to be doing in life, which is awesome. You know, it's like, um, but yeah, there was that time where I had to wear my bass. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Except that high. Yeah. There was a time where I needed it low to my knees, you know, but, but um, you know, it's, it's, again, I think finding that niche, like being a creative like yourself, it's like, for me, I'm not doing music really at all. You know, I've had a few people reach out to maybe record some bass lines for them, but I'm doing what I love to do. And it's, I'm still a creative working with video and video production. Yeah. Um, and it's just that different outlet. And again, it's like, I still have a bass hanging behind me. So once in a while I'll pull that down and, yeah. and play something. And, um, but, uh, you know, I'm just grateful and thankful that I've, I've done what I've done and accomplished what I've accomplished. And I yeah. think it made me a better human yeah. now because yeah. of that and because of my failures. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I tell all my students is that you, you learn by making mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you're not going to learn anything. So you got to embrace, embrace those mistakes, embrace those failures, because that's, that's the only way you improve. So but well, I think um, I think what we'll do is I'll I'll stop recording and then we can just chat real quick second follow up. So I think we'll close out unless there's anything else that you want to mention. I think we'll we'll call this interview good. Yeah. Anything? Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. You know, thanks again for for reaching out and for putting this together. It's great. You know, it's been great keeping in, in contact with you over the years too. You know, unfortunately it's been at a few different funerals, um, but uh, you know, 
it's 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 awesome. You're a great person, and um, thank you for for reaching out to do this. All right. Well, don't don't go away yet. But uh, okay, everybody. This has been uh, Dave Turner and Marty Meisner chatting base and the history of the Mayfield Four, Citizen Swing, and Miles Kennedy music projects uh, in all their formats. So. Uh, thanks for watching. Don't forget to uh, hit the thumbs up button and please subscribe. Okay. All right, Marty, take care. Don't go anywhere. I'm just going to stop the recording. Okay. Bye-bye.